The number of people who've died from coronavirus in Italy has now overtaken the figure uh, in China. In the past 24 hours, uh, the Italy uh, death toll has jumped by more than 400 deaths, taking it uh, to just over 3,400. Well, across uh, Europe, it's been another day of grim statistics and images as the virus spreads. According to the AFP news agency, more than 100,000 people are infected uh, right across the continent. Let's take a look. We're going to start now uh, in France, Paris. Uh, tougher restrictions have been brought in on day three of the lockdown. Cycling is now banned. Any outdoor activity is restricted to just two kilometres from people's homes. The authorities uh, say the initial 15-day uh, lockdown has been extended. 372 people have now died in France. Next, let's go to uh, Madrid uh, in Spain, the centre of Spain's outbreak, really. Some hotels are being used as makeshift hospitals uh, to free up space. And now let's move to uh, Poland, uh, these amazing pictures. This is the border with Germany, and you can see huge traffic jams. This one's stretching uh, 50 uh, kilometres. But on the plus side, we have seen um, kind of positivity, I suppose, of sorts, solidarity at least. Uh, this is Verona in Italy. They've been singing and playing the national anthem there at an empty fruit and veg uh, market. Well, let's stay in Italy. Um, because, of course, the nationwide lockdown has been extended there beyond next week. Northern Italy is worst hit by the outbreak. Uh, some grim footage uh, come out of one affected town, uh, Bergamo. This video was posted on social media. It shows military trucks carrying coffins uh, of coronavirus victims to other provinces because local crematoriums are just struggling to cope. Nearly 100 people have died in the town and listen to this senior doctor uh, from a hospital uh, in the town. We are in full emergency with this coronavirus pandemia. Our health personnel, nurses and physicians are working round the clock countless hours to fight this incredible situation. We do not know how long this pandemia will last. I have two messages. The first one is for the general population. Please stay at home. The second message is for whoever wants to help us. We are in desperate need of both nurses and physicians, together with ventilators and dispositives for protection. And I'm afraid another grim warning from a nurse working at a hospital, this time in Milan. Uh, this is her assessment. We are all working in a state of very high stress and tension. Psychological tension has gone through the roof. Unfortunately, we can't contain the situation in Lombardy. There's a high level of contagion and we're not even counting the dead anymore. Well, Italy's been under severe nationwide lockdown for 10 days now. The Prime Minister, Giuseppe Conte, has warned that life won't immediately return to normal when the worst is over. Here's Mark Lowen in Rome. Italy's lockdown is the model being adopted elsewhere. Public transport and traffic are still running, but people are only going out in urgent need. And it's orderly, with measured queues for the supermarket as people are allowed in one by one. The fruit and vegetables are stocked as normal. There's very little sense of panic buying here. And with the loo rolls, well, some brands are down, but with this level of outbreak, Italians are behaving, on the whole, rationally. Well, let's take a look now at the rest of Europe. The EU uh, chief Brexit negotiator, Michel Barnier, has tested positive for coronavirus. He posted this on Twitter. Hello and thank you for paying attention to this very personal and exceptional message. In this very deep coronavirus crisis that is touching the whole world and Europe in particular, I want to tell you that I have tested positive for COVID-19. So face-to-face -face talks on the future relationship between the UK and the EU after Brexit have all but stopped. Some of Mr Barnier's team members uh, are also now uh, in isolation. Across Belgium, there are nearly 1,800 cases and uh, tough lockdown measures are being enforced. Here's Gavin Lee, who's in Brussels. There are 
police patrols uh, on the streets. There are, it seems to be largely being observed today, but there have been instances in parks in Brussels where people have congregated in big numbers, either playing football or having a picnic, and it's been dispersed by the police. And the warning from the Interior Ministry here in Belgium is that you'll get two warnings. First of all, you'll get, well, you'll get the initial warning, and if you're seen again, there's a 4,000 euro fine or a three month prison sentence. And the Interior Ministry is saying, you should call the police if you see groups of people out of the house. In Monaco, Prince Albert has tested positive for the virus and is now working from home. Meanwhile, the pandemic is causing a huge amount of stress on everyone right around the world. People are exhausted. Uh, this was the Dutch Parliament on Wednesday. And just keep an eye on the uh, top of the picture here. <laughs> The Minister for Medical Care fainted at his lectern. 56-year-old says uh, he was exhausted from weeks of intense work on coronavirus. Uh, more than 2,000 people in the Netherlands are infected. Right, let's move uh, from Brussels and head to Germany, where the death rate uh, from coronavirus is much lower than in other countries. And uh, there are more than 14,000 uh, cases uh, nationwide. The BBC's Jenny Hill has uh, some of the answers uh, from Berlin. There are a number of theories as to why the death rate in Germany is comparatively low. The first is that the experts say Germany is in the relatively early stages of the epidemic. Secondly, it has a well-resourced and rather robust health system. But thirdly, and perhaps crucially, it's about, the experts say, the way in which testing has been carried out here. The authorities have tested very widely and they've tested very quickly. That in theory means that people are being caught in the early stages of infection and in theory it means that there are fewer undetected cases out there. And um, It's perhaps worth noting too that a lot of the people who've been tested and confirmed positive so far have been relatively young. Just having said all of that, they do expect that death rate to start to rise. Well, nearby countries have recorded much higher death tolls. One example is Spain. In just 24 hours, the number of fatalities jumped from 200 up to 803. And that's the number of cases, 17,000 people across the country infected. And the BBC's Guy Hedgeco is in Madrid. Here in the Madrid region, where we're seeing around 40% of all cases. And that obviously puts a tremendous amount of pressure on the local healthcare services. Now, the government has tried to take measures to alleviate that, not just here in Madrid, but elsewhere across the country, for example, by uh, nationalizing private hospitals. But it does seem to be a big problem here in Madrid in particular. Also, we have seen a number of outbreaks of the coronavirus in retirement homes. Now, elderly people are obviously a particularly high-risk group, so that could be contributing as well to that relatively high death rate. And in addition to that, there has been some criticism of Spain when it comes to its testing for coronavirus, that the testing hasn't been done soon enough, that it hasn't been rigorous enough, and therefore that when people are being hospitalised, um, that it's that much more difficult to cure them and indeed to save their lives. The Tokyo 2020 Olympics is still in doubt, but in Greece, the Olympic flame was formally handed over to Japan. Uh, the ceremony uh, was being held behind closed doors. Uh, Tokyo 2020 organisers insisting the Summer Games will go ahead. Uh, the torch arrives in Japan on Friday for a simplified relay that's scheduled to start in Fukushima. Well, this, of course, is an economic crisis, too. We've had a big development uh, from the European Central Bank. Let's take a look. It's pledged $820 billion package to ease the impact. Uh, the ECB boss, Christine Lagarde, has been tweeting, extraordinary times require extraordinary action. Uh, there are no limits to our commitment to the euro. Uh, we are determined to use the full potential of our tools uh, within our mandate. So what exactly is being promised? Here's Tyg Enright uh, from the business unit. Real echoes here of what happened during the financial crisis when uh, her predecessor, Christina Lagarde's predecessor, Mario Draghi, talked about doing whatever it takes to support and to save the euro. The effort, you know, the, 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 the idea being that central banks, and this central bank in particular, might bend, flex, change its own rules to do whatever necessary to ensure that markets are stabilised. Back then, it did bring some relief to markets. Today, the, whatever relief there was on stock markets was pretty short-lived. They are falling again. But there is always this open question when it comes to market 
interventions and things like quantitative easing, which is what effectively we're talking about here, money printing, the idea that you can throw buckets of water on what is a very, very big fire. It might not extinguish the fire, but until after the event, and maybe never, we might not understand how much worse it would have been had the efforts not been made in the first place. For the first time, China has reported no new homegrown cases of the coronavirus, a rare, rare bit of good news, I suppose. Um, now, that includes Wuhan, the city where the outbreak began, which has been on lockdown uh, for nearly two months. Uh, the quarantine rules have been slightly relaxed in Wuhan. It is still uh, designated a high-risk area, but people are now being allowed uh, to walk around their compounds and exercise outdoors. Chinese media claiming if no new cases are reported for 14 consecutive days, the restrictions could be reduced further. Well, Singapore and uh, South Korea, let's head over there because uh, they're both having some success battling the virus at home. Singapore reported 47 new cases, of which 33 were actually imported. And South Korea has recently been able to limit the outbreak there, uh, but it had a sudden jump in new cases, 152, with 74 of those uh, coming from a nursing home in uh, Daegu. Uh, Japan has only reported three new cases. Hokkaido is the worst affected Japanese region, but is now lifting its state of emergency, uh, which has been uh, in place since late February. Now, given uh, the recent success, a growing concern in Asia is people bringing the virus back from abroad. Despite having no new cases uh, domestically, China did record 34 new infections among people coming into the country from abroad. As Stephen McDonnell uh, now reports. 34 new cases. Most of those are in Beijing, in fact, and a lot of these are Chinese people returning home from North America and Europe, believing that this is now, this is the safe place to be. And for that reason, the Beijing government even issued a sort of statement saying that all these Chinese students studying overseas, unless you have a good reason to, you shouldn't come back. So they're already trying to tell people they don't want them flooding back into the country because everything's kind of under control now. And imagine there have been cases of people with coronavirus symptoms, who've boarded planes, they've taken drugs to suppress the conditions, so it, it seems like they're all right. They arrive in Beijing, somebody gives them a proper test and they have the coronavirus. Now imagine that, again, you could be infecting everybody on that flight, you're in a crowded airport, more infections, and that's why in big Chinese cities there are still these very strict quarantine rules. Iran has reported its biggest jump in coronavirus deaths. 149 new fatalities have been confirmed in the past 24 hours. The death toll is now nearly 1,300 and there have been more than 18,000 confirmed cases. It's the worst affected country in the Middle East and on top of that, experts believe the number of cases uh, may be underreported because testing is being restricted to severe cases. Here's Rana Ramport from BBC Persian. Iran is a very vast country and we're with more than 80 million people and uh, reports from many cities and smaller towns say that they don't have test kits and they're unable to test all the people who are uh, passing away. But interestingly, uh, Kiyonusha Jahanpur, one of the spokespeople for the health ministry, said that every hour 50 Iranians are uh, be, uh, be, being infected by the coronavirus and every 10 minutes one person is dying. This is already a very high number. And if uh, we believe I I these numbers are true, it seems that the measures that the Iranian authorities are, have introdu introduced are not enough. So here's the situation in the Middle East. Uh, these are the five uh, most affected uh, countries in the region. Israel, nearly 530 cases, and the government there says it will impose a curfew for the next seven days. Qatar, over 450 cases. Bahrain, uh, one death and nearly 280 cases. And Saudi Arabia uh, has almost uh, 240 cases. But Iran is the epicentre of the uh, region's outbreak. The government's been criticised for responding too slowly. Even so, this week, it closed a Shia uh, Muslim shrines uh, in Qom. And take a look at this, though. You can see people still went outside uh, the shrines uh, to uh, pray. Well, in the US, there are more than 11,000 confirmed cases of coronavirus and more than 150 people have died. Washington state is the worst affected with uh, 68 deaths. 
President Trump has asked U.S. health regulators to roll out potential therapies aimed at treating the virus. Clinical trials are already underway for many new therapies, and we're working on scaling these to allow many more Americans to access different drugs that have shown really good promise. We've had some un really good promise. President Trump named two drugs uh, that the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, is uh, currently looking at. The first is uh, Remdesivir. It's an experimental uh, antiviral drug. Um, it's produced by Gilead Sciences, whose headquarters uh, are in California. And uh, this man is the company's boss, Daniel O'Day. He was at the White House earlier this month meeting with the president and uh, the task force there. Uh, the second uh, drug is a common anti-malarial called uh, hydroxychloroquine. Here's the FDA chief. We need to make sure that these, uh, the sea of new treatments will get the right drug to the right patient at the right dosage at the right time. As an example, we may have the right drug, but it may not be in the appropriate dosage form right now, and that may do more harm than good. Those are the things that that's our job to look at, and that's why it's really important we have these dedicated professionals looking at these aspects of therapeutic development. Well, here's an expert speaking from Palo Alto on what these two drugs are all about. We know that remdesivir, which is one of the drugs that's being trialed now in the United States, um, has been shown to have broad antiviral activity against numerous viruses. Um, so. Hopefully those studies, which have been underway now for a few weeks, uh, also um, here and in China, we will have some information coming forth soon. The other drugs that um, President Trump were talking about, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, um, are drugs that we have used to treat malaria in the past. There's some uh, promising information that came out um, over the last few days showing that patients who received hydroxychloroquine uh, may rapidly clear uh, their viral load from uh, SARS-CoV-2 quickly. I need to caution, though, that this is a very small study, and this is why we need to do a larger um, clinical trial or study to find out more information. OK, we're going to look at uh, what's going on in other parts of the world now. And uh, in India, uh, which has more than 170 confirmed cases and four deaths, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has ordered a curfew of staggering proportions. Uh, the BBC's Arunadei Mukherjee in Delhi has the details. Asking citizens to not come out of their homes unless absolutely necessary. The Prime Minister said the symbolic day-long curfew on Sunday, the 22nd of March, from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m., will be a test of the country's resolve and show of unity. All except those involved in essential services have been urged to observe this public curfew. The Prime Minister, many observers say, use this opportunity to perhaps prepare citizens in case India has to observe a formal lockdown in the near future. Well, let's move to Africa, which has 640 confirmed cases across more than 30 countries. That's according to the African Union and the Africa Centre uh, for Disease Control and Prevention. And let's take a look at this image, uh, which really shows uh, the spread with the darker red areas uh, where there are more cases. Now, the continent is being warned to prepare for a big jump in the number of cases. In fact, the head of the uh, WHO is from Ethiopia. Let's take a look at what he said. Uh, he said, Africa should wake up, my continent should wake up. Well, the coronavirus has so far multiplied uh, more slowly in Africa than in Asia or Europe. And there's been speculation that's because of the higher temperatures there. Well, let's take a look at that. Uh, this is um, our correspondent. It's quite long, but basically he says, as yet there's no evidence that the spread of the coronavirus uh, is reduced in Africa due to the higher temperatures there. Uh, other studies into flu have been going on, uh, but all viruses are different, and this is a new uh, virus. But one factor uh, that's been highlighted is the role of religion on the continent. Here's the BBC's Anne Soy. People congregate either on Friday for the Muslims and over the weekend uh, for Christians. And across the continent, there are more and more calls uh, for religious leaders to reconsider uh, holding big meetings. Uh, South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa held a meeting with religious leaders today in South Africa to urge them uh, to do this. Uh, in Kenya, there was a similar 
call from President Kenyatta over, uh, over the weekend. And we have seen that the evangelicals have heeded that call. Some of them will be streaming their services uh, on Sunday. Uh, the Muslims have said that uh, people uh, should not go to the mosques. This is unprecedented. Brazil is closing its land borders for 15 days, blocking entry uh, from all of its neighbours except uh, Uruguay. Now, many of you will have seen this picture, um, which I'll hopefully be able to show you. Now, there we go. Uh, it's the statue of uh, Rio de Janeiro's uh, The Christ, the Redeemer, lit up with images of continents grappling uh, with the pandemic. And you may also have seen and heard this. For two nights now, uh, people have been banging pots in protests. They're angry at uh, President Bolsonaro's handling of the situation. Uh, he'd previously dismissed uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic as a fantasy. Well, Katie Watson, as you can see, is in uh, Sao Paulo. Katie, good to see you. So what are these protests all about? Well, these protests are um, they're just the anger really, that people feel about the way Bolsonaro has handled the coronavirus crisis so far. Um, you may have heard just a, a few days ago at the weekend, there were these huge marches that were organised in support of Bolsonaro against uh, Congress, and they'd been planned for a while. Um, but he, he came out saying they need to stop, we need to call them off because of the health of, uh, of Brazil. That said, people still came out on the streets. He came out, he shook hands, he took selfies. And in the last few days, he's been giving press conferences, updating people about the, the severity of coronavirus here in Brazil. And he's actually, you know, tried to justify, really, justify exactly why he went out saying that it was for the people of Brazil um, and that, you know, people needed to, you know, stop this hyster hysteria. And that's a word that he keeps coming back to, this hysteria that people have around coronavirus. Not the message, though, um, that the uh, health ministry is giving out, who seems to be much more um, professional, really, and, give, and leading the country um, in a time when people here are very nervous. And what, what about the restrictions and measures and things that could be coming down the line there? Well, as you mentioned, the land borders have been closed here in Sao Paulo, where we've seen the, the highest number of cases. Uh, shopping centres have been told to close until um, until April. They've uh, supermarkets and, and pharmacies; they're allowed to stay open. Um, there are delivery services and it, for restaurants that so you can't go out and sit in a restaurant now very easily. I mean, the roads here are, are very, very quiet. And in a city that's you know uh, the, the the bigger cities, we're talking 20 million people, but the streets are clear. That's a uh, you know never seen in this in this country in the big cities. So certainly people are taking notice, trying to stay indoors as much as they can.